much for having me. Uh, I'm just, I came here about five years ago, I guess, when I was visiting at Caltech and talked about the work that we've been doing about causal inference. And what I've actually been doing for the last uh, semester was being part of a group at Salt and Oscar uh, looking at the evolution of human cognition. So I've suddenly stepped into these waters about evolution and comparative works that I are completely new to me. Um, and it, I thought this would be a wonderful group to try out some of these ideas on. Uh, okay, so the big puzzle, as we all know, is that we see these really radical changes in cognition between us and our closest primate relatives. And we know that they happened as a result of changes that took place extremely quickly. So the question is, what could have happened? What sort of small, relatively small changes in genetics could have led to such large changes in behavior? Uh, and part of the trouble is, of course, that we don't have very good data. And one of the things that I discovered venturing into the waters of evolutionary psychology is why people hate evolutionary psychology, which is that um, there's the ratio of the speculations that you can make to the amount of data that you have is, is notoriously extremely large. Uh, but there is one thing about the changes that took place that made us distinctively human, for which I think we actually have good data, and we have the right kind of data to make evolutionary arguments, although you can still not knock down ones. And that has to do with the fact that we had this extended childhood. Um, so for example, if you actually look at the fossil record, which is, is what you would really need to look at to try to uh, make evolutionary arguments, there's a paper that just came out in PNAS looking at dentition in Neanderthal versus uh, uh, modern humans, uh, and in fact looking at fossils of modern humans in the past uh, at the same time as uh, Homo sapiens that were around at the same time as Neanderthal. And by looking at dental records, you can see that even relative to Neanderthals, our period of childhood seems to have been longer. Uh, and relative to primates, of course, famously, our period of childhood is much longer. Um, now, there, in the old days, they used to talk about that this was the result of bipedalism and the result of women having to produce babies earlier. But this difference, even between Neanderthal and Homo sapiens, suggests that there might be more than that going on. And it suggests that this period of long extended childhood is connected to the distinctive cognitive capacities that we have from state. And, and that we're at the other end of the spectrum, if you want to make an evolutionary argument, it also is helpful if you don't just look at a single species. And in fact, this generalization between extended immaturity in the young and high level cognition in the adult is really remarkably robust across a remarkably wide range of different kinds of organisms. And in fact, poster children, as it were, or the poster birds for this relationship are actually not even mammals at all, but uh, but birds. Uh, and this famously is the distinction between altricial and social species. This is the new Caledonian crow uh, using tools. These crows are, in many respects, of the sophisticated as chimpanzees. Um, on the other hand, with our friend the domestic chicken and all of the relatives of the domestic chicken. Um, who are basically as dumb as stumps, or at least very, very well adapted to their particular evolutionary dishes, I think for grade, but not much more doing anything else. When you look at the period of immaturity, the crows in general are immature for as long as a year. I just had a guess for Muscle Gray, the New Caledonian crows are fledglings for as long as two years. And he actually has wonderful film of just how hopeless and hapless and useless these uh, crows are in this early period of immaturity, dropping things and failing to do things. And if they weren't actually being taken care of by these adults, they would be in truly pathetic shape. Um, you actually see <laughs> this same correlation, uh, not only in mammals, not only in us, not only in primates, not only in mammals, uh, not only in birds, but also in marsupials. So there's a paper that uh, just came out recently that shows marsupials include a very, very different evolutionary history you see a very robust correlation between uh, how immature the babies are for how long and relative brain size relative to body in the adult marsupials. Um, so these are, and that in turn is related to another part of this adaptation for extended immaturity, which is parental investment. So a marsupial 
the this is an idealized version. This is a the one, one part of the fun of all this, which I also did when I was in Australia, is finding out about all these incredibly bizarre, strange marsupials that you've heard about. This is actually a quokka. And a little quokka family, the quokkas just have one little quokka baby at a time, and they're <coughs> social monogamy and lots of parental investment, and they have this wonderful quokka life. And this is a, a possum, which my Australian friends would point out is an Australian marsupial, the only American marsupial. Um, and the possums have large clutches, lots and lots of babies. Um, the babies are mature quite quickly. There isn't nearly as much parental investment. I'm not sure that I mean, even human mothers occasionally look like this, but maybe not quite all the time the way the possum uh, mothers seem to. Um, and when you look at relative brain size, although Quokkas and opossums are good comparisons, so they're just about the same body size. But the quokka brains are something like three times larger. Now, no one can quite figure out what the quokkas use the brains, those brains for, because we know essentially nothing about quokka evolution. But among marsupials, the basic relationship between brain size relative to body size and immaturity, and also parental investment, seems to be a, <coughs> a, a, a highly robust relationship. So, Across many, many different uh, animals, you see this relationship between uh, brain size, relative period of immaturity, and degree of parental investment. Now, it could be that this is just because it takes longer to grow brains, but it's, I think it seems plausible for lots of reasons to believe that the fact that those brains are actually have an extended period in which they can learn, can be shaped by the environment, can be constant, is a big part of this general evolutionary trend. And of course, if you think about human beings, we're way off on the end of the spectrum on all of these different measures. So we have enormously large brains, we have very uh, elaborate cognitive capacities, uh, our young, our immature, I always say my son is now 23, and at least until they're 23, we're putting in investments to take care of them. We have what I think of as the, trippy, the triple whammy parental investment adaptation, which is that we have uh, menopause and grandmothers, and we have social monogamy, and we have alloparenting all at the same time, all things that differentiate us from our closest climate relatives. So we have a lot of adaptations for parental investment. And, uh, and we have these uh, striking and sophisticated suite of cognitive capacities. Uh, all right, how, would, how can we make sense of all of this from a developmental perspective? Uh, I think what all this suggests, and it's not a knockdown argument, but at least it's an extremely plausible argument, is that this reason for this period of immaturity, which comes with tremendous costs, particularly those costs of heavy parental investment, is because it enables you to have a period of protected learning. So if you think about alternative kinds of strategies that you could use to get on in the world, the chickens are extremely well adapted to one particular environmental niche. What we're very well adapted for is dealing with many, many different environmental issues. And in fact, the ecological context in, we, in which we evolved was a context in which there was very highly increased variability in our environment. Uh, and then when we started to have capacities for culture, we could actually create even greater variability in our environments. So our trick seems to be, we don't know what environment we're going to grow up in. We have this protected period in which we can learn about that environment, and then we can take those things that we learned in the protected period and actually put them to use as adults in that particular environment. So my slogan is that you could think of children as being like the research and development division of the species and we are production and marketing. So there's a division of labor where they get to just figure out what's going on in the world, be the blue sky guys, and then we take the things that we've learned when we were children and we can put them to use to thrive in whatever particular environment as out. Um, now, if that's true, then the picture you have of development, of looking at comparison between children and adults, is that uh, rather than thinking about it as people often do in both psychology and neuroscience, rather than thinking of children as being sort of defective grown-ups, grown-ups missing important bits that ought to be there in, uh, in adults. Um, Instead, you might think of it more as being like two different developmental stages of the species that are designed to serve different functions, more like caterpillars and butterflies, except that they're the butterflies who are floating around exploring, and we're the caterpillars that are walking along our little narrow adult path. Um, so on this picture, what you think is that the children might have 
in many respects have capacities that are actually greater than the capacities of adults when those capacities involve things like very wide-ranging exploration and learning, even if they're much worse than adults at capacities like taking the things that you've learned and actually exploiting them. And it's interesting that when you look at the <coughs> learning literature, in reinforcement learning in particular, but in general, it turns out that forget about humans or even animals. If you're just designing a system that is going to work effectively in the world, like a robot, for example, it turns out that in order to get the very best system, you need to have a balance between two very different kinds of things the system can do. One thing the system can do is explore, look at many, many different options, consider many different hypotheses, including low probability hypotheses. Uh, the other thing that the system can do is exploit. Take whatever you think the most likely effective technique is and implement it as effectively as possible. And it turns out that in machine learning, there's an intrinsic tension between those two strategy, and the way that that problem is often solved is by actually having two different periods, one period in which the system gets to explore, and another system in which the system uh, gets to explore. So for example, with some robots, um, Todd Lipson at Cornell has these wonderful dancing robots, and what the robots do is they spend the whole first period of their robot existence dancing. They, throw their arms around, they explore, they figure out what their model is, and then they start doing the things that they're actually supposed to do. And it turns out that those robots are much more robust than robots that don't get the theory of exploration. Uh, an idea in machine learning that people have a lot, which I really like both as an idea and a metaphor, is that often systems go through a process called simulated annealing. And the idea of simulated annealing is that there's an early period when the system is high temperature. In other words, the system's bouncing around from lots and lots of different hypotheses, randomly moving from one possibility to another. Um, I like this because it sort of catches what I think children are like, too. So these are machine learning systems are bouncing off the wall just like two-year-olds are bouncing off the wall. That means that the system can explore the space, can find what might initially seem like low probability hypotheses. And now, once the system's explored the space, it cools down and just searches in the little parts of the space that are most likely to actually be effective. So now the system's actually trying to decide what to do. You don't want it to be off there trying weird, strange alternatives. It just does the, takes the information it's acquired in the, uh, in the high temperature phase and now is using it in the low temperature phase. So another, uh, perhaps less catchy motto that you could have is to think about childhood as being evolution's way of doing simulated annealing. Evolution gives us this early period where we can do exploration, and then uh, we can take what we've explored and explore it later. And I think you can see this in other differences between the ways that uh, childhood uh, and adults work. So a distinction between an early period of play, which is another way of saying exploration, versus the later period where you're actually working. Uh, you can think of it as a difference between an early period where there's a high premium modernization versus a later period where you're trying to uh, ha carry on the uh, innovations that you discovered before. Um, and I think there's also an interesting difference that comes out in the machine learning literature as well between having an early period with lots and lots of variability, where variability is the thing that you want, versus a period where you have high instability. And again, if you think about children and childhood, they're kind of the way of instantiating all of these other values. Um, if that picture is true, what you might expect is that even very, very young children, perhaps especially very, very young children, would be equipped with really powerful learning capacity. And over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, I talked about this at length last time on it, was five years ago, a number of us in developmental psychology have been working on the idea that, for example, these children might have uh, learning capacities that come out of philosophy of science and computer science literature that involve having causal models of the world and using Bayesian inference over those causal models. And I'm not going to say anything today about the details about how this works. Um, but essentially, the idea is that these are learning capacities that are the sort of learning capacities that enable scientists to make progress in science. Essentially, the picture is that even very young children are trying out a range of causal hypotheses about the world and assessing the probability of those hypotheses, given the evidence that they get from the world, accepting the hypotheses that are confirmed, discarding the hypotheses that are, hypotheses that this, uh, that are less probable, 
and then starting the whole process over again. So what this gives you is it gives you a way of the, the great thing about these models is that they give you a way of um, uh, of actually combine. Oh, sorry, let me. Uh, oh, please hold that for just so. The great tension in cognitive development for a long time, uh, the great tension in cognitive science in general, is that we seem to see a lot of abstract hierarchical structure in children, in their representation. <coughs> um, but we also seem to see that those structures, those representations are learned. And there's always been a tension between those two facts. So nativists have said, yeah, there's a lot of structure, highly abstract representations. They couldn't be learned. They must be there in the first place. Empiricists have said, well, these must be the result of learning, and you're learning from very specific uh, events that you see in the world, so there can't really be this kind of abstract structure. It must just be kind of a, a huge. And the nice thing about these Bayesian models is that they let you have both. They let you have abstract hypotheses, but abstract hypotheses that can be changed, and that will learn the kind of data. And um, the causal <coughs> piece is also particularly important, I think, because if you're going back to the evolutionary uh, if you're going back to the evolutionary context, uh, causal understanding is a particularly crucial kind of understanding. And if you look at the two things that seem to be most distinctive about human cognition, our capacity for social cognition and Machiavellian intelligence on the one hand, and our capacities for things like intelligent tool use on the other hand, both of those have their underpinnings in understanding something about the causal structure of the world. Either the causal structure of the psychological world, in the case of theory of mind, kinds of uh, intelligence or the causal structure of the physical world in the case of things like food. So being able to have powerful causal learning abilities seems to be something that might be especially important for us human beings. So essentially what we've shown over the last uh, 10 or 15 years is that even very, very young children seem to have these capacities for very powerful causal learning in play from very early on. And this has been the result of experiments with our very high-tech device, the Blinken detector, this is a box that lights up and plays music and you put things on, some things on it, not others. Um, and what we've discovered is that we can give children patterns of probability or evidence about these simple systems, and then we can see what kinds of inferences they draw about how the systems work, and they draw <coughs> remarkably sophisticated inferences in just the way that a range of ways are going to um, But we could also ask <coughs> a question about how these kinds of capacities compare to the capacities that we see in non-human animals, the question that's relevant for evolution. And Anna Weissman, who's a graduate student in my lab, and Lucy Jacobs, who's a comparative psychologist, and I have been working on this for several years now. Um, so what do we know about causal inference in, uh, in non-human animals? Um, well, we know that uh, animals are capable of uh, classical conditioning, which means that animals are extremely good at detecting patterns of correlation out in the world. That's one thing that might be a prerequisite to doing causal inference. We know that animals are extremely good at operant conditioning, so we know they're very good at looking at the outcomes of their own actions and using that to draw causal-like uh, inferences. Um, one interesting thing that we don't know about is about how good animals would be at just inferring causal relations from simply the correlations that they observe. Um, so, uh, Mike Tomasello uh, and uh, Joseph Call give this example of, you know, if the uh, chimpanzee just saw the wind blowing apples off the tree, would they infer that the wind had actually caused the apples to fall? Um, so we wanted to actually ask this question in uh, dogs because they're uh, a species that uh, is very good at reading human cues, they're highly enriched, they're enculturated, and we know that almost by definition, they're the ones who started Pavlovian uh, learning and opera learning. Uh, now, there is actually interesting evidence that's out there that animals do have causal understanding in some context. So as I mentioned, they're capable of classical and instrumental conditioning. And in very elegant work that I assume you all know about, because it's work by our Blaisdell, right here, um, even rats turn out to be sensitive to differences in causal structure. Uh, and I think I won't go into the details about this uh, work, but it suggests that rats are capable of understanding that their outcomes of their own interventions or actions are different from just having the correlation that we see about the Nevertheless, it's still true that even in these experiments, um, 
the uh, rats don't <coughs> differ in how much they intervene themselves, even though they seem to make different predictions when they do something and when they simply see a correlation. They don't use that to shape their own behavior in the way that you would think they would if they were really making causal inferences. So the idea here is that the sort of real ultimate measure of whether you've made a causal inference is that if you think that A causes B, then you should try to bring about A in order to bring about B. That's what makes causation different from correlation. And that's something that Aaron's rats don't seem to be doing, although that can certainly be used. Um, another way that you could think about this, again, the slogan we have is, why don't Pavlov's dogs ring the bell? Right? So Pavlov's dogs <laughs> see the correlation between the, uh, between the bell ringing and the food. Um, and we know that from operant conditioning, that if they actually brought a, rang the bell themselves and brought it back to food, they would ring the bell again. Uh, would they ring the bell just as a result of seeing that correlation? And sort of amazingly, when you look through this enormous literature on, uh, on animal learning, although there are cases of savings and cues, there aren't really clear cases of how lost dogs ringing the bell. So that was the question we wanted. Um, so if they, dogs simply observe the covariation, will they actually use that observed covariation to bring about an outcome themselves, which is what they should do if they really think that that whole covariation is possible. Does everybody? And by the way, feel free to ask clarification questions. I can go to the Okay, how could we ask this? Well, what we did was we uh, set up the situation, situation like this. The dogs, the dogs got clicking detectors, um, and what the dogs saw in the first phase was the dogs saw that when one of these machines lit up, that treat and train in the middle actually dispensed food. And when the other one lit up, the treat and train did not dispense food. And in good classical conditioning fashion, after seven or eight trials of this, the dogs started anticipating the food when they saw one of them light up, but not when the other one lit up. So they would go to the treat and train when the appropriate uh, uh, process. Then what we did was in the next phase, we actually gave the dogs a chance to learn how to bring about that outcome themselves. So in the next phase, we took away the treat and train, took away the food dispenser, and just encouraged the dogs to push a target stick, which would make one of the boxes light up. Um, and the dogs learned to light up both of the boxes with the target sticks, and we use sort of social reward to get them to, to do this. Um, now the question becomes, now in the test phase, the treatment train is back there, and both of the, uh, the target sticks are there, which one will the dog intervene on? So will the dog now try to bring about the outcome that they originally saw in the observation uh, phase? Uh, and, uh, and then they're given the chance to interact. And the answer is that the dogs didn't. The dogs just performed the challenge. So the dogs were no more likely to activate the <coughs> machine that had brought about the food than the machine that had brought about the food. Um, so we thought, well, maybe this was because they'd forgotten it. So we tried doing the operant part of the task first. So first we demonstrated the, first we got them to, to do the target sticks and we changed the order. That didn't make a difference. We got ball crazy dogs thinking maybe they didn't have enough motivation. That didn't make a difference. Um, well, but we wanted to have a more controlled, I mean, obviously, you know, this is a negative result with non-human animals. There's a million reasons for this. So what we did was we now did a control condition where we did the experiment exactly the same way, except that now in the initial phase, instead of just seeing the correlation, the dogs actually brought about the correlation. So now in the very initial phase, what happened was instead of simply seeing the detector, sorry, I'm Instead of simply seeing the detector light up and then the treats be dispensed, the animals actually knocked over the target stick and, uh, and saw, the, saw the animals dispensed. A very interesting thing that we noticed that we'd really like to follow up on is that in fact four of the six dogs when we did this went over and tried the other uh, machines spontaneously themselves, even though they hadn't yet been rewarded for it. So it was as if they were kind of exploring what the outcome of this action would be. Uh, and in and all the dogs learn the contingencies in about the same number of times as in the classical case. So this means the dogs, you, know, you might have thought, well, maybe the response was extinguished in the second phase when there was no reward. Maybe the animals forgot the classical conditioning information. Maybe they weren't really motivated. Um, but in this case, where the action was actually the result was the result of their own action, 
all of the dogs immediately first trial chose the correct uh, chose the correct uh, uh, target state. Were there any changes in the device between the training and testers against the metal cap? So no. all the others that involved some kind of context change or from what, what, the, the training phase to the test phase. I'm just wondering how sensitive they might be to context changes. Like they're they're seeing lights light up and then in the second phase they're socially motivated to press levers. Right. But it's not with a full functioning device. It would would like is that right? In the second phase, the second phase and the third phase were identical in this, in the training and in the other experiment. <coughs> and okay. in the it may sound like you had a different device that they learned to press levers to make the lights without the food cover. No, 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 no. Everything, everything else about is exactly the same. So in the control condition, everything else is exactly identical. It's the same experiment or it's the same setup. The only difference is that in the uh, in the original version, instead of the dog knocking the target stick off and the machine lighting up, the machine just lights up by itself. That's the only difference in the two conditions. Um, in fact, the light is not the cause of the food being delivered, though. It, it is just associated with it. Um, well, the question is, that, so again, the we can ha you can have a long, and I have had a long <laughs> philosophical question uh, issue about you know what exactly does it mean for X to cause Y. But for our purposes, and this comes from a kind of particular philosophical perspective, the difference between, what do we mean by, what's the difference between two things just being correlated and one thing causing another? And at least one idea you might have is, if you think that two things are causally related, then you think that if you intervene to change one, you'll change the other. So the example is, if you think about um, smoking and lung cancer, you don't think that having yellow nicotine stained fingers is causes lung cancer, even though it might be correlated, it will be correlated with lung cancer. Well, what do you mean when you say you think they're correlated but not caused? What you mean is you don't think that cleaning up someone's fingers is actually going to change lung cancer rates, whereas you do think that stopping people from smoking is going to change lung cancer rates. Right, but in this situation, I mean, dogs are constantly confronted with things that are predictors but, they, but not causes and things that are causes. Yeah. And in this case, maybe the dog is is perceiving this accurately as a predictor, not could, a cause. Can we save this for the discussion? Yeah. Oh, this is okay. maybe that, that, maybe not a clarifying So in any case, I mean, that might be true, but again, the main point that I want to make is, in this case, which is otherwise almost identical, same objects, the animals don't seem to be behaving really differently. So in this case, where the dogs get a little bit of operant information, then in the final phase, they do seem to be treated. Or at least, if you define treating as the cause, intervening on it to bring it back to the patient, we have to do that. Um, oh, we went to do the same thing with children, and at this point, we actually discovered something very interesting we didn't expect. We thought the children would be extremely good at doing this, um, and what we discovered. So it's literally exactly the same, the same materials. The only difference is it's cones that they take off instead of target sticks. Um, and what we discovered was that three and four-year-olds actually were good at doing this, but toddlers were not. So two-year-olds were no better than the dogs at making the right decision, making the right intervention, when all they saw was the correlation. And that's not just a, an observation that we've made. Uh, Laura Schultz's lab in MIT has the same result. We published it in Cognition jointly a little while ago. Across a really wide range of circumstances, different kinds of objects, different kinds of causation, it turns out that two-year-olds are not good at doing this, solving the test either. On the other hand, four-year-olds are. So four-year-olds and three-year-olds are extremely good at doing this. Another interesting thing about the two-year-olds is when we changed the uh, we changed the uh, experiment slightly, so that now what happened was we assumed that the two-year-olds, like the dogs, would be able to do it if they intervened themselves. But now what we did was we just had another person intervening in that first phase. So now, instead of bringing it back to effect themselves, they're watching someone else bring it back to effect. When we did that with the two-year-olds, the two-year-olds were near the ceiling. So the two-year-olds had no trouble inferring from somebody else's actions, from the outcome of what somebody else did, what the right outcome was going to be. They had a lot of trouble when they just saw the same information as a pure correlation. Um, and Andy Maltzoff is a collaborator in this work, and we've done a bunch of other studies showing that this result is a real is really a robust result. So, for example, if you change the temporal 
uh, relationship between the cause and effect, you don't get the children imitating the action. So it's not just sort of dumb imitation. The children are really intelligently working out what the cause and effect should be. And I can talk about some of that later on. Now, we couldn't get the dogs to even kind of be in the ballpark of doing this task. There are other people who seem to have found imitation in dogs, but neither we nor we couldn't do it. And Mike Tomasello, who's spent a lot more time doing it, couldn't do it. So if they are doing it, it's very fragile, and they're not showing this kind of uh, we're not they're not showing this kind of behavior in this task. Okay. Uh, may I'll just go quickly. Okay. Uh, so the, the, to sort of take the most sort of fundamental basic kinds of causal inferences, just being able to infer the relationship between a single cause and a single effect, we see some interesting differences between what even very young children, toddlers, are doing and what uh, uh, dogs and animals are doing. But it's also interesting that this thing that seems to be so distinctive about our adult causal understanding, which is that we have this kind of unified understanding that puts together things about actions, about correlations, about mechanical relationships, is not something that seems to be there to begin with. It seems to be something that we're actually constructing in this protective early period of childhood. Uh, how what might we be uh, constructing it? Well, one of the interesting things that's come up recently, since the last time I gave a talk here, is that children are not only use the basic kind of framework not only enables you to make specific kinds of causal inferences about specific causal relationships, it also lets you make more abstract, broad-ranging inferences about how causation works at all, or about how a particular causal system works at all. Uh, things that look more like what we see in intuitive theories. Um, and there's very interesting, exciting work uh, on the formal side showing that it can be the case. We wanted to see if this was going to be true about for children, and we also wanted to see if we could test a bit of this simulated annealing idea, the idea that the children might actually be exploring more than the adults were. So in order to do this, we went, but this is working with kids like this, in order to do this, we went back to our blinking detector, and we can do this experiment here. Here's a pattern of data about blinking detectors. You see D go on and nothing happens. E goes on and nothing happens. Now you see D and F together, and the blinking detector lights up twice. Uh, how likely do you think it is that D is the blicket? Uh, has been found to be. How about E? How about F? Nope. Good. You're a gross. Um, <laughs> but how about if you also saw this sequence of events? So now these are three new blocks, A, B, and C. Now you see A, B, and C together independently don't make it go. A and B together don't make it go. But A and C together do make it go. And B and C don't make it go. Now suppose you went back and you saw this sequence of events, right? Well, in order to make sense out of this sequence of events, this sequence of events suggests that there's actually a conjunction. It's not just that each individual block makes it go, but that you have to combine A and C. A and C won't do it together, but in combination, in conjunction, they actually will. And that might change how likely you were to think that. Now, in this case, you might go back and think, oh, well, maybe this is a conjunction. Maybe it's really that you need D enough to be able to do this. So what we did was we did exactly that experiment that I just showed you, and we did it with undergraduates at Berkeley, and we did it with four-year-olds. And it was exactly the same experiment for the undergraduates and the four-year-olds. All the language was the same. It was, it was completely the same. And in one case, what we did was give training that the relationship between the blocks was this or relationship. One will make it go, and the other one won't. And I might say, by the way, that uh, again, at right here in, in UCLA, the assumption that it's an or, that one block will make it go, has the power to make it go, or doesn't. That's very basic to lots of theories about what human causal inference is like. So it's basic to Patricia Chang's theory, for instance. So this is a very, very natural hypothesis for adult humans to have about how a causal system like this works, is that it has this kind of or structure. Um, but then we also gave uh, an example of this other uh, structure, this conjunction structure, where you need two things together to make it go. And adults can understand that, but that doesn't seem to be sort of their first hypothesis about how the system actually works. And I might mention that part of the reason why we did this was because we'd done another experiment um, uh, with looking at the kinds of causal structures that three and four-year-olds could understand. And we had set up the, uh, we'd set up the uh, materials thinking that the choices would be about which blocks they were going to choose 
And in fact, the children spontaneously started giving us these hypotheses that were conjunctive. That's part of the reason why we did it. Um, OK. <laughs> then what happens is in the test, the children and the adults see exactly the same ambiguous information that you saw to begin with. Um, so now they see the ambiguous case. Remember, this is the blue block. And they have to decide, is D a four-bit base F? Um, and what we discovered was that in the or case, both the adults and the children <coughs> behaved in the normative way, just as you would expect. But in the and case, the children actually behaved more intelligently than the adults did. So in the and case, the children seem to be much more willing to consider the conjunctive hypothesis than the adults were. So even when the adults got data that showed them that this machine might work according to this unlikely principle, they stuck with the principle that was <coughs> the one that was more likely. Whereas the children, in this kind of simulated annealing way, were more willing to go to the unlikely hypothesis. So two things are interesting about this. One of them is these very young children, these are four-year-olds, already are not only making specific causal inferences, but they're pulling out this higher order hypothesis about, oh, OK, this machine works on a conjunctive principle <coughs> versus a disjunctive principle. And they're actually getting to the low probability hypothesis better than the adults. Can you just explain real quickly what the test is? So what the oh, sorry. So do? the test is just, here's D. Now you see D and E and F. And you, uh, uh, the, the, it's not, is it obligate, but uh, how much obligatosity? Does, does this one have obligatosity? So can we explain that obligatosity is stuff that is in the blinks that makes them make the machine go? And the question is, do you say, does this one have obligatosity? Does this one have obligatosity? Does this one have obligatosity? So the crucial one is D. So that's the one where you discount it when you first, if it's an or, then you should discount that, uh, that it actually has the So what I've been talking about so far is about children have, having these abilities to make quite sophisticated and interesting causal inferences. You might wonder, but so far what I've been talking about are all cases where there are sort of physical things about inferring things about blocks, market machines. Um, what about psychological cases? After all, we know that understanding about the world is particularly important. And particularly in this group, you might think, well, so far, the kids have all just sort of been learning more or less on their own. Now, notice that the children were very good at learning from other people's actions. Uh, could we use the same kind of approach to say something about how culture might function um, and how cultural information might be uh, carried on? Um, so to do that, we looked at another whole other set of questions. And these are questions about how children imitate. And, as you saw in the first experiment, we saw that even toddlers, even two-year-olds, are very good at learning from imitation and seeing the outcome of what's going on. So. But there's an interesting tension in the literature um, between what looks like very intelligent imitation and what people sometimes call over-imitation. So the phenomenon seems to be that sometimes when children see someone produce a complex pattern of actions that leads to a causal outcome, they seem to imitate even parts of that action that aren't actually necessary to bring about causal outcomes. Um, and if you think about it, when you say, uh, I was just talking to Clark about this, imagine that you're in a hunter gather culture and you're watching someone do some complex operation like gathering or like cooking or like putting things together. It's actually not at all an obvious question about which bits of the actions that they perform are really causally effective and which bits are just sort of conventional or are uh, uh, unnecessary or just happen to be the thing that the person's doing at this time. That's actually quite a complicated question to ask, and an important one. So what we did was we wanted to figure out if children would use this kind of Bayesian inference to solve this problem <coughs> about figuring out what someone is doing and why they're doing that. <coughs> and so what we did was we gave the children a toy that lit up and played, uh, didn't light up, it played music when you did some things to it, but not others. And what they saw was they saw a demonstrator who performed three actions in a row on the toy. And then at the end of the three actions, either the toy would play music or it didn't. And the statistics of the action sequences could tell you something about what the most effective way of using this toy, of what the most effective way of activating the toy actually was. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is that we designed this to see, so the statistics didn't determine the right causal answer. But they made some answers more probable than others. 
So for example, if you see this sequence of events, this is like squish, strike, push, and the outcome is common. Um, the most probable outcome, the most probable hypothesis is that all three of those actions are necessary in order to bring about the event. That's not absolutely necessary, but that's the most likely hypothesis. Whereas if you see this sequence of events, then the most likely hypothesis, or at least a likely hypothesis, is that only the last two actions are necessary, the first, <coughs> first one is variable. And if you see this sequence, only the last one is necessary, not the other one. And notice that this sequence acts as a kind of control for this one because it's exactly the same action, the only thing that's different is the, uh, uh, is the outcome. Um, so what we did was we actually showed the children, and you can actually show normatively from the model that just by making a few assumptions that you're going to prefer simpler hypotheses that, uh, that those probabilities that I mentioned, the probabilistic predictions that I mentioned before. Um, so here's a little clip of a child. Do you know this is going to be crazy? Yeah, I've never been with it. So you know what's funny about it? It plays music. But I don't know how to make it play music yet. So I thought that what we could do is we could try something. Okay. No matter how easy you go, it makes it go. All right, so it's gonna be your game. We'll see what makes my new game. Hmm. Okay, what should I try? All right. Well, what if I squish it and then I squeeze it here and then I pull this ring? Oh! Good <laughs> music. Should I try that again? All right. Squish it, and then I'll squeeze it here, and then I'll pull this ring. Yay! Maybe I should try something else. Try something else. What if I squish it, and then I shake it, and then I pull this ring? Do you hear anything? No, I don't hear anything either. Okay, so the, the, the child sees 10 of those sequences of actions, like the one You show children something that they're interested in, and they're, so they'll sit there through 10 different, uh, 10 different sequences. And then at the end... Why don't you make it go? Why don't you make it go? Now they just oh, good job! What they do. And you can see that was filed in that BC condition. And that. what you did was pick out just the two effective, just the two effective actions from that model. Yeah. Um, feel free to defer this to the discussion if you're not going to address it. Um, maybe you can clarify. That, so you compared this to over imitation, but the model begins by saying he doesn't know how to make it work. Is that characteristic it of all? We're, yeah, we'll get there right now. Okay. That's, that's setting up for the end. Um, so what we discovered was that, in fact, the children behaved almost in exactly the way that the model said that they should behave. Um, and interestingly, again, the probability of their actions was predicted by the model. And that makes the point that the children aren't simply deciding on things. They seem to have this range of hypotheses with different probabilities, and they're expressing that in their range of, of their uh, response uh, projected decisions. So the children were picking out the BC, the double. The double is just picking out two actions, and this is the single, this is picking out one action, they were picking that out in the case where that was the normatively correct uh, answer. But of course, we had exactly the question that you uh, mentioned. One thing that we noticed was that, in fact, the children were, uh, were pick, still picking that triplet, still picking the, the three sequence more than we might have expected uh, if they were just not paying any attention to the model at all. Um, so we thought, what would happen if we actually had a model who knew what was going on, who was actually informing you about what was going on? And it turns out that we can actually say something about what, so we, now we had a pedagogical case in which not only was the, did the child know something about the causal structure, but now they knew something about what the other person knew. In particular, they knew that the other person knew how the thoughts worked. And we can actually model this too. So we could think about this as being a kind of joint causal inference, where you're both trying to infer what the causal structure of the objects are and infer what's going on inside of the mind of the other person when they're giving you these demonstrations. And very elegant work that Pat Schachter and Neil Goodman has done 
shows how you can normatively model what should a pedagogical demonstrator do. And you can kind of think about how you can kind of think about how this works. If I know that someone is teaching me, then I know they should be trying to give me the information that will be most effective in leading me to the right answer, and that will lead to my predicting something about what kinds of things they're actually going to do. Um, so what we did was we just did exactly the same experiment, but now instead of saying, I have no idea how this toy works, the experimenters said, this is my toy, I'm going to show you how it works, and did exactly the same thing. And when we did that, what we discovered was that in the pedagogical case, the children never produced that doubles, never produced the, simply the, uh, the, as it were, right answer from a rational perspective. So when you think that what the person is doing is informative, then you imitate exact, then you are imitate, then you actually are doing what the person uh, is trying to do. Um, so the point of it, there's a couple of interesting points about this. One of them is that the children, even the four-year-olds, are sensitive to what is actually a very subtle statistical pattern. If you're looking at it, it's hard to even track as an adult, I think, well, wait a minute, exactly what happened. Um, but not only are they sensitive to that pattern, and not only are they sensitive to that pattern, even though it really is statistical, it's about probabilities, um, but they're also sensitive to the statistics of cultural interaction. So they're already sensitive to information that they have about what the intentions of the uh, person who's demonstrated to them. And what that means is that you already can have this kind of tension between the exploration behavior, the kind of novelty-seeking behavior that you see when the children are just exploring by themselves, and what they do in a kind of pedagogical cultural transmission setting where they narrow into the thing that the culture is actually trying to teach them. So I think some of this, you see that this kind of explorer-exploit trade-off just in the very fact of childhood versus adulthood, but you also see it in the tension between exploratory behavior and teaching and cultural transmission behavior. And you can see the cultural transmission has some big advantages because you're narrowing in on the, if that is the right answer, you're narrowing in on it much more quickly. You're not getting distracted by alternatives that might turn out to be irrelevant. Um, on the other hand, it has the disadvantage that it just leaves you in the narrow cultural uh, uh, alternative. And I think this is quite interesting if you're sort of thinking about human culture in general, because one of the things that is, a kind, again, a kind of paradox is we think that if you just are always reinventing uh, innovating, doing things based on your own experience, then you'll never get a cultural rash effect. But on the other hand, if all you did was simply take the cultural information from the previous generation, then you also would never get the cultural rash effects. So you need to have this combination of having a period when you can have innovation, and I think childhood is that period, and then having mechanisms that also enable you to have cultural transmission. And I think what this shows is that if children are doing this kind of Bayesian causal inference, that's exactly a mechanism that will let you do both, will let you take the information that would um, enable uh, observation and innovation and take information about the cultural context and, and combine. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, and here's the, here's the predictions, and again, those predictions are both. Um, um, got a few minutes, so let me talk about this last example. So, uh, so that's one example where it looks as if culture is playing a role, and also that children are using these kinds of inferences to make psychological and cultural inferences, not just physical inferences about looking detectors. You still might say, well, okay, that's still kind of a, a somewhat unnatural situation. Um, could we show that children are actually using these procedures to learn something, a piece of intuitive theory or knowledge about the world that we know that they really do develop, that they really do learn, um, and something that's really important to them? Uh, uh, so we decided to look at whether children could use this kind of inference to infer something about personality and traits. And we know, this is now in press in childhood. Um, by the way, that last experiment is out in, uh, in published. Um, we know from you know, a long history of social psychology, one of the great ideas in social psychology, has been this idea about attribution theory, which is that people explain human actions either in terms of long-lasting individual personality traits or in terms of external situations. And this decision about which kind of explanation you give can end up being, it has all sorts of other consequences. In fact, in some cases, it can literally be a matter of life or death. In, when people uh, saw the uh, Abu Ghraib uh, uh, tortures, 
their first uh, intuition in the West, for example, was that this was because these individual people were sadists. And it turns out that actually, uh, probably most people put in those situations were behaving these kind of terrible ways. Uh, so it's really important about how to explain uh, people's actions. And we also know that there are interesting cultural variations. So we know that in, you know, this is pretty absurd overgeneralization to say the West and the East, but we know that in our culture, for example, we tend very strongly to make these over-attributions to individual personality traits, and in other cultures, probably in fact in most other cultures, uh, there's much less of a tendency to do this, and much more of a tendency to use one of the individuals about kind of situations. So we wanted to say, where does this come from? Where does this set of ideas, uh, 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 causal ideas of that world come from? And when you actually look at the developmental literature, you look at the developmental literature, uh, children don't seem to start doing these kinds of personality trait attributions until seven or eight, until sort of middle, middle, middle school time. The preschoolers don't spontaneously seem to explain actions in terms of personality traits. So where could this come from? Well, we thought maybe it would come from some of these statistical factors. Oh, sorry, this slide that I'm holding. Um, okay, so here's what we did. What we did was we showed children uh, patterns of covariation between uh, what a person did and either who the person was or the situation in which they found themselves. So the children were two little dolls, Josie and Sally, and a bicycle and a trampoline. And Josie get, goes on the trampoline. Uh, it, it, so in one condition, in the person condition, Josie goes on the bicycle three out of four times, and she also goes on the trampoline three out of four times. And this is all demonstrated to the children with little dolls. So here's Josie. Oh, look, she's bouncing on the trampoline. Oh, look, that time she didn't bounce on the trampoline. Oh, look, now she's bouncing on the trampoline. Uh, and again, we did it probabilistically to see if we could, could do this really statistically. Um, so in the personal condition, Josie always plays and Sally never does. In the situation condition, both Josie and Sally play on the bicycle, but they don't play on the trampoline. And then in the control condition, they just see Josie on the bicycle and Sally on the trampoline. Now, if you were doing a kind of normative causal Bayesian inference, what you should conclude is that in that condition, the data is telling you it's something about Josie that's responsible for the action. In that case, the data is telling you it's something about the situation, about the bicycle and the trampoline. And in the control condition, you don't have enough data to make an inference. Um, so what we did was we just gave children these uh, patterns of data. And then for the very last, whatever the last action was, whether they played or didn't play, we just said, could you tell me why Josie did that? So we started out just with a spontaneous explanation. The kids could provide any explanation they wanted. And if the kids didn't provide an explanation, we gave them a forced choice. We said, is it because she's a brave sort of person, or is it because the bicycle is safe to play? So we gave a choice between a, a trait or a situation. And the data came out the same way, whether we just analyzed their spontaneous explanations or the forced choice. Um, so these are the sort of things that the kids said. Interestingly, they, as we predict from the previous developmental literature, they occasionally said things like she's brave, but they didn't use trait terms very much. But they seemed to sort of recognize that there ought to be a placeholder for a trait-like term. So they said things like, she's the big sister, she's the little sister. Or she knows how to ride a two-wheeler, and she doesn't know how to ride a two-wheeler. So they kind of found person-specific, person enduring, traits, enduring characteristics of the person to explain this pattern of, of data. Uh, these are four-year-olds. Uh, and we did this experiment with four-year-olds, and we also did it with six-year-olds. Now, the real secret with personality traits is not just that you give these explanations, but also that they shape the predictions that you make. So we also asked the children a prediction question. So after they'd seen all the data, they gave the explanation, and we said, all right, now here's Mary. And Mary is going on the bicycle uh, or the trampoline. I mean, here's Mary. What will she do? Will she go on the bicycle or the trampoline? Or else we said, here's the diving board. What will Josie and Sally do now? Will Josie go on the diving board? Or will Sally go on the di diving board? Everything got that. So if they had the person prediction, then they should predict that a new person will, sorry, if they had the uh, person prediction, then they should predict that the people will, individual children will act the same way in the new situation. If they had the situation explanation, they should predict that a new person will act in the same way in that situation. Does everybody? Okay. Um, so here's the data 
for the explanations, here's the four-year-olds and the six-year-olds. If you look at the uh, four-year-olds, the four-year-olds were acting like beautiful scientists. They uh, made exactly the right explanation that was supported by the data. So in the control condition, they were 50-50 between person and situation explanation. In the person condition, they made person explanations. In the situation condition, they made situation explanations. The six-year-olds, on the other hand, were interesting because the six-year-old, you might have thought, you know, six-year-olds are, are, have more information processing, they're sort of generally smarter and more knowledgeable than the four-year-olds. In fact, the six-year-olds were sensitive to the data too. It wasn't that they were ignoring the data, but it was as if their bias, their tendency to make individual trait attributions was pushed up. Their prior, as we would say in a Bayesian context, for the trait person attributions was much higher than <coughs> it was for uh, the four-year-olds. Um, so in this situation, the four-year-olds were actually paying more attention to the data the six-year-olds were paying attention to the data, but they seem to have built up this assumption, this kind of prior about, uh, uh, about person. And we saw the same thing in their predictions. So both the four-year-olds and six-year-olds made good predictions in the person case, but the four-year-olds made good predictions in the situation case, and the six-year-olds didn't. So the six-year-olds were already making something like a kind of fundamental attribution error. Um, so we think that what's going on is, although in some ways the six-year-old uh, response is not as smart as the four-year-old, uh, of course in other ways it is. So if what's happened is that you've picked up data between the time you're four and the time you're six, which generally supports a person attribution, uh, then, sorry. <laughs> um, If you, if you picked up data which generally supports a person, person attributions, then it does make sense that you should balance, you should weight those person uh, causes more heavily, even if now you have a little bit of data that's going in uh, the other direction. So are you guys looking at this in other cultures too, where it would be, the situation condition would be one that right. would be an adult? We have, we have, actually have our data from China. We went to China, got the data, and we know that in the control condition, the, so the Chinese four-year-olds look just like the American four-year-olds. They're being sensitive to the data. We don't have all the six-year-old data yet, unfortunately, but at least in the control condition, the six-year-olds look like the four-year-olds. The Chinese six-year-olds look like the American four-year-olds. So at least in the control condition, we're not seeing this bias, person bias, in a lot of Chinese samples. But we haven't got all the data for the person and situation. Is your hypothesis that they're going to be that the Chinese six-year-olds are going to behave like the American four-year-olds, or that they're going to be overly situational? Well, that's uh, the, right. So we don't, don't know. we don't, know. we don't know. I mean, one or the other, we don't know. But our assumption is that they won't show as much of a person bias as the uh, American six-year-olds. Um, so the picture is that these kinds of so the, there's again two things that are interesting. I think here one of them is that. Uh, this kind of abstract causal reasoning is influencing uh, a, set of in, a set of inferences that are really crucial for everyday life, that we know that children and adults make and that are really important for their everyday life. And again, we see this kind of tension between the advantages of exploring a wide range of options versus once you've got evidence in favor of one option, going with that single option. So in a way, what you're seeing is kind of this explore-exploit trade-off happening even just in the course of acquiring more knowledge. So the very, one of the basic ideas behind the Bayesian framework is that as you acquire more and more support for a particular hypothesis, it's going to be harder and harder for you to overturn the hypothesis. And that's actually rational. But what that also means is that just by the very act of learning more about the world, you're going to be less open to low possibilities than you would have been otherwise. So what we think is there's sort of two things going on. I think part of what's going on is that there's just a sort of basic maturational developmental process such that the younger children are more open to the world than the adults are. But I think in addition to this, the very fact that the adult and the older children know more than the younger children is leading them to be less open to uh, low probability uh, options. Uh, okay, so. Get, get back to the original question uh, about what kinds of things, what might all this tell us about uh, the origins of, uh, of evolutionary, uh, of, of human cognition. Uh, I think that what happened in the course of 
cognition is not that somehow we have brand new computations that we didn't have, uh, that no one, had, no animal or organism had ever uh, had before. In fact, we can show that non-human animals are very good at doing this kind of Bayesian reasoning in very specific contexts, like as part of their motor behavior or part of their visual behavior. I think the example the dogs show that when you give dogs a chance to uh, see the outcomes of their own actions in this sort of operant conditioning case, they're extremely good at making causal inferences. Um, and I think Aaron's uh, work shows that in some cases when they have the kind of information you'd see in classical conditioning, they're very good at making causal inferences. So it isn't that the non-human animals are not making causal inferences and, and, uh, and human beings are, it's more that the non-human animals are only doing these computations in very specific contexts with very specific inputs. And at least by the time they're four, human beings seem to be making these uh, inferences across an incredibly wide range of contexts, including these uniquely human social and cultural contexts, like trying to figure out whether someone's doing something based on their, uh, based on their personality traits. Um, but a second thing is that there actually also seems to be an effect of just, I think, the amount of time you have to do these computations. So I think just the fact that we've got this extended period, and I think this comes out of our finding about the toddlers versus the four-year-olds um, in, the, in the dog experiment, um, just the fact that the, the, it, it may very well be that the four-year-olds get to this more abstract concept just because they've got that extra two years to crank through these computations to get to the more abstract uh, concept. Whereas it looks as if, well, at the point when the dogs stop doing this kind of novel wide-ranging learning, um, they haven't had enough time to actually make those higher level, uh, make those higher level uh, inferences. Um, and then the last thing is this exploration exploitation balance where I think it's quite plausible that part of the human uh, 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 trick was to have these much wider ranging capacities for exploration associated with having this much longer uh, period of childhood. Uh, but perhaps also associated with more playful and exploratory behavior even in adults and having this kind of extended um, uh, 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 give me the word. No, um, so that's Stephen Jay Gold's work. Uh, extended, yeah, you know I mean. as you can see, as you get older, you're older, you're older. <laughs> so I'll end there and we can do some questions.